You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. The small area around what is now Cape Town was the first part of South Africa where Europeans settled. When Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama reached Calicut, India in 1498, his journey around the Cape of Good Hope opened up a direct route to Asia for Western Europe. This development made it necessary to establish and secure trade posts in the east. In 1500, the Portuguese landed in Mossel Bay and explored Table Bay two years later. By 1510, they began inland raids. Subsequently, the Dutch, seeking a piece of the trade pie, sent their ships to India and established the Dutch East India Company, abbreviated as VOC, in 1602. The increase in ships passing the Cape led the VOC to realise the value of the Cape's natural harbour as a refuelling spot for ships en route to the Orient, resulting in the founding of a supply station there in 1652. However, the VOC wasn't initially keen on Europeans settling permanently within their trade empire. Despite this, during the Dutch rule which lasted 140 years, many VOC employees retired or were let go and chose to stay on as private citizens. A notable number of these former employees were interested in farming and applied for land grants, eventually forming a distinct community called Vrijlieden or Vrijburgers, meaning free citizens. Starting from 1688, the Cape became attractive to other European settlers, including French Huguenots fleeing religious conflict, as well as people from the Flemish, German, Danish, Norwegian and Swedish communities. Over time, these European settlers and their descendants formed a unique identity, known as Afrikaners or Boers, meaning farmers. In 1806, the British took control of the Cape, initially to safeguard the sea route to the east against Napoleon, however. They soon saw the potential to develop the Cape further, which led to friction with the Afrikaner Boer population. This disagreement, among other reasons, saw about 15,000 Boers, known as Trek Boers, leaving the Cape between 1834 and 1840 in search of independence from British rule. These emigrants, known as Vortrekkers, initially moved east to what later became Nathal and founded the Natalia Republic. Others went north, settling beyond the Orange and Vaal rivers. Despite the Vortrekkers' efforts to establish their own territories, Britain annexed the Natalia Republic in 1843, turning it into the crown colony of Natal. After this, British policy shifted against further territorial expansion in South Africa. While there were failed attempts to annex more northern territories, Britain eventually recognised the independence of areas beyond the Orange and Vaal rivers through the Sand River Convention of 1852 and the Orange River Convention of 1854, concerning Transvaal and the Orange Free State, respectively. Despite their political differences, the four territories in southern Africa shared a deep connection. Most of their residents were Europeans and Africans who had moved from the Cape, and it was common for people to have family or friends across these regions. The Cape, as the largest and most established state, led the way in terms of economy, culture and society, while people in Nettle and the two Boer republics mainly lived off farming. However, everything changed in 1870 when huge diamond fields were discovered in what is now Kimberley in Griqualand West. Despite the Orange Free State having historically claimed this land, the Cape managed to annex it with Britain's help. Then in 1884, gold was discovered by Jan Gerrit Banches and later by the Struben brothers, sparking the Witwatersrand gold rush and the birth of Johannesburg. The discovery of gold in these places turned the Transvaal into the wealthiest area in southern Africa almost overnight, attracting tens of thousands of foreigners, mainly from Britain, looking for jobs and riches. These newcomers, known as Uitlanders, soon outnumbered the local Boer population. Worried about losing independence to the British, the Boer government tried to limit the influence of these Uitlanders by setting strict residency requirements for voting and imposing heavy taxes on the mining industry which was mainly run by the British and Americans. These actions led to growing frustration among the Uitlanders, who felt underrepresented. President Paul Kruger, with advice from his close associate Jan Gerrit Banches, decided to place a hefty tax on dynamite, further aggravating tensions. This move, among others, headed the Transvaal Republic towards conflict with Britain and fueled negative sentiments between Germany and Britain, culminating in the Anglo-Boer War from 1899 to 1902. Cecil Rhodes, the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony and a significant figure in the mining industry through his partnership in De Beers, hoped to bring the Transvaal and the Orange Free State into a federation under British control. He and his business partner were instrumental in escalating the Uitlanders' grievances. Rhodes, fearing a Uitlander rebellion that he believed could lead to negative consequences for Britain, told journalist W.T. Stead about his concerns of facing an American-style republic in South Africa 
hostile and competitive against Britain. To prevent this, Rhodes saw it essential to intervene. By mid-1895, Rhodes schemed to organise a raid with armed forces from Rhodesia to back an Uitlander uprising, aiming for a takeover. However, the plan stumbled from the start, largely due to reluctance among the Uitlander leaders. Back in September and October of 1895, there was a significant disagreement between the governments of the Transvaal and the Cape Colony. This disagreement was centred around how the Boers, who were the Dutch settlers in the area, were attempting to protect their trade. The Cape Colony was dissatisfied with paying the high fees that the Transvaal government demanded for using their portion of the railway line to Johannesburg. Therefore, they decided to bypass the railway and instead transport their goods directly across the Vaal River by wagon. In response, Paul Kruger, the president of Transvaal, chose to close these crossings, known locally as drifts. This action greatly upset the government of the Cape Colony. Even though Transvaal later reopened the drifts, the damage had been done, and the relationship between the two remained strained. In preparation for possible troubles, a man named Leander Starr Jameson, who was employed by a company led by Cecil Rhodes, positioned a force of approximately 600 men at Pizzani, right on the border with Transvaal. This group, composed of police and volunteers, was heavily armed, prepared to assist Johannesburg's British residents, known as Uitlander, in an uprising against the Boers. The strategy was for Johannesburg to initiate a revolt, seize the Boer armory in Pretoria, and then Jameson would rush in to restore order, effectively gaining control of the gold fields there. However, as Jameson waited, the inhabitants of Johannesburg could not reach a consensus on the type of government they desired post-coup. Some even advised Jameson to stand down due to these disagreements. Despite this, Jameson, feeling the pressure and eager to act, decided to proceed with his plan. On the 29th of December, 1895, without clear backing from Johannesburg and amidst communication failures due to late arriving telegrams, Jameson's force crossed into Transvaal aiming for Johannesburg. They hoped for a swift action before the Boer commandos could react and inspire the uprising. Nevertheless, not everyone believed this was a wise move. Joseph Chamberlain, the British colonial secretary, actually sought to halt Jameson, fearing the raid would have negative repercussions, especially since the locals were not fully supportive. But messages to stop Jameson arrived too late. He had already severed the telegraph wires to Cape Town, though by mistake, not those to Pretoria. Once Jameson and his force entered Transvaal, the Boers quickly pursued them. Early on the 1st of January, Jameson's force clashed with a Boer outpost, and then later, at Krugersdorp, they encountered a roadblock set by Boer soldiers. After suffering losses in men and horses during a skirmish, Jameson attempted to outmaneuver the Boers, but by the 2nd of January, at a place named Dornkop, they were overwhelmed by a larger Boer force. Realising they were in a hopeless situation, Jameson surrendered to Commandant Piet Cronger. His raiders were taken to Pretoria and incarcerated, marking a bold but ultimately unsuccessful attempt to alter the region's power dynamics. After the failed raid, the Boer government handed the involved men to the British for their trial and the captured British prisoners were sent back to London. Shortly after this incident, the Kaiser of Germany sent a message, known as the Kruger Telegram, to President Kruger and the Transvaal government, congratulating them on their success without needing help from other countries, hinting at Germany's potential support. This message, when revealed by the British media, sparked a wave of anti-German sentiment in Britain. Dr. Jameson, the leader of the raid, was celebrated by both the media and London society, fueled by a surge of nationalism and anti-Boer and anti-German sentiments. He was sentenced to 15 months in prison, serving his time in Holloway, and the Transvaal government received nearly £1 million in compensation from the British South Africa Company. Conspiracy with Jameson landed members of the Reform Committee in Transvaal, including Colonel Frank Rhodes and John Hayes Hammond, in harsh prison conditions, convicted of high treason and initially sentenced to death by hanging. However, their sentences were reduced to 15 years in prison, and they were released in June 1896 after paying hefty fines. For his involvement with Jameson, Colonel Rhodes was dismissed from active military service and barred from future army involvement. Upon his release, Rhodes joined his brother Cecil in the Second Matabel War, following the depletion of Matabellan's forces due to Jameson's raid. Cecil Rhodes had to resign as Prime Minister of Cape Colony and as a director of the British South Africa Company because of his role in the raid. The raid left Matabeleland vulnerable, leading to the uprising in March 1896, now honoured in Zimbabwe as the First War of Independence, or the First Chimurenga, but internationally known as the Second Matabel War. 
This uprising saw the Ndebele people, soon joined by the Shona, rebelling against the British South Africa Company, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of European settlers in the early stages and more over the ensuing months. With a critical shortage of troops, the settlers built a defensive position in Bulawayo and conducted patrols under leaders like Burnham, Baden-Powell and Selous. It wasn't until October 1897 that the Andibel and Shona ceased their rebellion. Relations between the British and the Boers hit a critical low point due to a significant incident. Tensions escalated when Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany sent a telegram to Kruger, congratulating him for defeating the raiders, which many interpreted as Germany offering military support to the Boers. This move by Kaiser Wilhelm, who was already seen as not being friendly towards the British due to a naval arms race he started with Britain, added fuel to the fire. As the situation grew more tense, the Transvaal region began bringing in a lot of weapons and formed an alliance with the Orange Free State in 1897. Jan C. Smuts, reflecting on the events in 1906, stated that this incident marked the start of a war, despite a four-year gap that seemed peaceful. He pointed out that during this time, the two sides were merely gearing up for the inevitable conflict. Despite initially supporting plans for armed support in Johannesburg, Joseph Chamberlain publicly criticised the raid. Meanwhile, in London, although some media outlets criticised the raid, most newspapers used it as a chance to stir up anti-Boer sentiment. Despite facing legal consequences in London for their actions in South Africa, Jameson and his cohort were celebrated by many as heroes. Chamberlain saw the Transvaal's aggressive stance as an opportunity to take over the Boer states. In the United Kingdom, the Liberal Party did not approve of the Boer War and later took a firm stance against it. Jameson, later on, became the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony from 1904 to 1908 and played a key role in founding the Union of South Africa. He was honoured with a baronetcy in 1911 and moved back to England the following year. When he passed away in 1917, he was laid to rest next to Cecil Rhodes, and the 34 soldiers from the British South Africa Company who died in the First Matabel War in 1893 in the Matobas Hills near Bulawayo. Jameson's role in the Jameson Raid has always been a bit puzzling, especially because it seemed out of character compared to his earlier life, his successful political career afterwards, and his overall history. In 2002, the Van Rybeek Society published a book titled Sir Graham Bower's Secret History of the Jameson Raid and the South African Crisis, 1895-1902. This book, edited by Derek Schroeder and Geoffrey Butt, contributes to the evidence suggesting that the raiders' conviction and imprisonment were unfair. This conclusion is based on more recent historical analyses, which highlight political tactics by Joseph Chamberlain and his staff. These analyses suggest Chamberlain tried to conceal his own involvement in and knowledge of the raid. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.